Today we're going to be watching a video called Six Proofs for God's Existence. Other atheist YouTubers have done their own things on this video, as they've already gotten to pretty much every video before me, but this one popped up and I thought, hey, why not? It opens with Socrates. I like Socrates, may as well. So let's see what's in store for us today. Socrates once stated that we should follow the argument wherever it leads. When we look at the most profound question of life, does God exist? We should certainly follow his advice. When we do, we'll find evidences that show us God is real. Let's is evidences really the best way to put that? I know this is a nitpick, and I don't think there's anything wrong with using evidences, but for some reason it just rubs me the wrong way. And it should go without saying, you do not in fact find evidence of God wherever you look, or else there would be no atheists, because, you know, we look around. I mean, shit, I, look at me, I'm looking around right now. I don't see nothing, okay? Let's look at six proofs that show God exists. Number one, the universe must have a cause. Okay, that's what's called an assertion. Assertions are not proofs or evidence. Assertions are assertions. First of all, you need to prove that the universe must have a cause. I have yet to see proof for this claim. Let's hope he provides some. The most fundamental law of science is the law of cause and effect. And it says that for every material effect we see, there is a cause that came before it or was simultaneous to it, and that is greater than it. Let me explain something for our uh, theist friends here. When we talk about natural laws, what we are talking about is how this universe works. And when I say this universe, I mean the thing that exists after the Big Bang happened and created all of the things we see around us, all of the matter and such that we see around us. Universal laws apply to this iteration of space-time as we see it. It does not apply to, let's say, the singularity that caused the Big Bang, nor does it imply to whatever came before it, if there is such a thing as before it. The universe is a material effect. So what caused the universe? The Big Bang. Uh, a singularity was a thing that existed a long time ago. You go back about 14 billion years, and what you would find is, well, nothing, but a little bit after that, and you'll find a singularity existing. This singularity is everything in the universe around us, all in a singular point, infinitely hot and infinitely dense. Its expansion is what we call the Big Bang. The expansion of the universe is caused by this event. You see, if you don't believe in a creator, then you have to suggest something like uh, a singularity. That's what is popular today, that there was some type of singularity that exploded in something called the Big Bang. But then no, it's not just popular today. I mean, it's science. We have a lot of proof of that. Uh, what does he mean, popular today? We know there was a singularity. We know the Big Bang happened. Uh, there's mountains of evidence for it. And you can see that if you just look at the sky with the right equipment. You can literally see the cosmic microwave background radiation left over from the Big Bang itself and the expansion of the universe. You can see that yourself. It happened. When you try to get down to the bottom of what's a singularity, well, what we hear from the scientific community that suggest to us, the, the cosmologists, they say, well, a singularity was something that popped into existence from nothing. Well, that's basically correct, so I'll give him some credit there. Although, you know, see, creationists always say, well, if there was nothing before the Big Bang, what created the nothing? And my answer would be, does nothing have to be created? Nothing is nothing, isn't it? How do you create uh, nothing? Nothing is just nothing. Do you know that if there ever were a time when there was nothing, that's exactly what we would have now? The idea that something... Again, another assertion. You are just asserting something. You have yet to prove that. Just because there was once nothing and now there is something does not mean that there should be nothing instead. That's an assertion. You're asserting this with nothing to your side. You are asserting this with no evidence. You're just saying this. What grounds do you stand on while saying this? How do you know something can't come from nothing? How do you know this? Something popped into existence from nothing is simply not a scientific idea. 
You see? They well, yeah, it is a scientific idea. You know how I know that? I've read more than just one book. I assume this man has only read the one. It sounds like he's only read the one. You know which one. They're suggesting that that singularity is somehow natural, but it behaves supernaturally. But no, it doesn't. Be what are you talking about? It doesn't behave supernaturally. Everything involving the singularity is scientific. They're, the whole basis for it is in science and scientific reasoning. There's nothing supernatural about it. You are the one who brings the supernatural into the existence of the universe. They say that that singularity wouldn't have followed the laws of nature. Well, then, so what are we left with? The laws of nature, as it were, originated in the expansion of the singularity. I mean, if you want to talk about nothing, unless there is a multiverse, which there might just be, and we are but one bubble within it, outside of our space-time is nothing, most likely. That exists, that's out there, uh, apparently. There is a great nothing outside of this expanding Big Bang bubble. Um, you know, this whole argument this guy is making is just a bunch of assertions that, quite frankly, make me think he doesn't understand anything he's talking about. We're left with the fact that the universe had a beginning and it was not a natural cause. It was something above nature. It was something super nature. So you have not proven this, my guy. You have asserted this. There is a difference between a proof and an assertion. Something supernatural. And so when we see the material effect of the universe, we can know that there was a supernatural creator that caused the universe. How? How do we know that? You haven't explained how we know that. You've asserted a number of things and then asserted this thing. But where does it come from? What? How do you get to these assertions? What is the underlying evidence for them? Proof number two. Design demands a designer. Not really. Um, they always say this, but that doesn't make it true. I mean, look at it like this. I used this example in another video recently. Uh, how did I get here? Did God uh, reach his hand down and plant me in my mother's womb? No. Somebody did do something like that, but that's a little bit too lewd to talk about, or especially for me to think about, considering the people involved. However, once all of that was over with, there was a fetus in there, and that fetus would grow up to be me. That came from DNA, not the hand of God. Then a baby was born. That baby was me. It was kind of a blank slate, except for the things given to it by genetics. But over time, after interacting with its environment, it developed into this beautiful, majestic specimen you see before you now. There was no designer involved in the process of creating me or developing me. Everything that I am came from natural laws. It came from the universe just behaving in the ways it behaves. It is a truism that everybody recognizes that this universe looks designed. In fact, when we see the various different aspects of nature and we see birds and squirrels and trees and we see all of the things that they do so well, Many times, we as humans, we try to copy and mimic that design, but often we don't do nearly as well as the design that we see in nature. The simple fact is that nature itself is the designer, and the reason why nature is better at it than humans in a lot of instances is that nature has had a lot longer to do it. Humans have existed for about 250,000 years, somewhere around 6,000 years since the first proper civilization sprang up. We are something like, what, 9, 10, 11,000 years from the first proper city spring up. I think Chital Hoyuk was about 10,000 years ago. Jericho is about 9,000 years old. I imagine the oldest are probably maybe a little bit older than that, two, 3,000 possibly. Maybe we haven't found them yet. Uh, but human civilization is very new. The scientific method is only a few hundred years ago old at this point. It was only a few hundred years ago that humans were able to codify a system that would enable us to progress so rapidly with technology. 
Human designs are very new. Natural ones had billions of years to work themselves out. Humans will never be as good at designing things as nature itself is. We have limits. Our limits are that we ourselves are the result of natural processes. We can never hope to go the speed of light. We may never get anywhere close to it. Give us a billion years and it is conceivable that we may have some kind of Star Trek future where we approximate a godlike species like the Q and are able to break and control the universe uh, like a god. This seems to me incredibly unlikely. Not impossible in the same way that God itself is not an impossible idea, but unlikely. Nature's designs work themselves out over a long period of time. Nature is the designer, and that should be apparent when you watch how nature works, when you understand the scientific reasons behind how things work in nature. It becomes apparent there is no God reaching down to control these things, that these things are the result of natural processes from within this universe. We look at the design of the human body and the human hand and the arm and the leg and the brain, and we see that those are some of the most advanced technologically savvy pieces of equipment ever put together and we try to mimic them and copy them and we can't do it as well. Why? Because we haven't had three billion years to do it. Look at how well we can approximate these things despite only having had civilization for about 6,000 years, despite only having the scientific method for about 300 years. If we can already approximate these things this well, there's no telling what we could do with it if given, let's say, a hundred thousand years or three billion years. There's just no telling what we're capable of. Yes, at this stage, our own designs are very rudimentary indeed. However, that doesn't mean they always will be, but nature has a three billion year head start on this planet as far as we can tell. That's a problem. That's a big problem. We've got a lot of catching up to do. But how long is it going to take us to catch up on these things? Think about the designs of robots at Boston Dynamics. Think about how incredible they are. One can scarcely imagine how long it took nature to produce animals that had the same senses of balance as Boston Dynamics sorts of like weird dog looking technologies. We are talking about um, these kinds of things probably only sprang up somewhere in the last billion years. So two billion years of evolution in order to produce things like humans have produced within 250,000 years of evolving into our modern form. That right there is pretty incredible. And in some ways, it does sort of indicate that there could be some bizarre Star Trek future of godlike cuteness in store. Again, do I think that's likely? Well, no. Possible? Sure. But don't underestimate the accomplishments we've had in the short time we've had on Earth versus nature and what it's been able to do. Because this universe exhibits design from the starry sky at night to the fingertips on your hand. The Another thing I want to say about design really quickly is that there are some really shabby designs in the human body. For example, the eye. You know, creationists love to point to the eye, which has, as far as I'm aware, uh, evolved something like, what, 80 times independently in nature? If you read the book, uh, The Greatest Show on Earth, The Evidence for Evolution by Richard Dawkins, he goes into this at some length. He suggests how the evolution of the eye happened based on the fact that you can find pretty much every stage that the eye would have gone through in nature today. So the eye, at least in humans, has some pretty big flaws. Uh, the human eye has blind spots. I mean, I mean, it has single blind spot in each eye. Um, the reason we have these blind spots is that there are cones in the eye and there's a spot where your optic nerve connects that there are no cones. There are no light detecting things where the optic nerve connects to your eyeball. What this means is that there's no way for your eye to pick up light in this one specific spot. You can do some tests. There are some really cool YouTube shorts that you can check out. I assume there are also TikTok ones, but I don't use TikTok, Instagram too. And you can check these out and they will let you see where your own blind spots are. How the blind spots work is like this. The brain literally patterns over the blind spot based on what is immediately around it. 
That is fascinating. That is clearly like not the best design you're going to find in nature. You want to talk about some amazing eyes. As far as I'm aware, cephalopod eyes don't have that specific problem. They don't have the optic nerve connection problem like we do. They don't have the blind spot, as far as I'm aware. You want to talk about some amazing eyes. I think hawks have something like 40 times the visual acuity of humans. And why do they need that? Well, because they're in the sky looking for rats far away on the ground. They need that visual acuity to survive. Humans, our eyes didn't really need to be all that great. I mean, they are pretty cool. Like, let's be honest, they are pretty awesome. But they lack whole spectrums of color that we can't actually see. Um, beyond that, the blind spot. You know, we didn't need the best eyes. Hawks needed much better eyes. I assume cephalopods also have their reasons. Uh, I would like to talk to a cephalopod sometime, see if they can tell me their reasons for needing such awesome eyes. But I assume if you're a cephalopod, there are probably some gnarly predators out there. We just needed to find lions, you know? Um, I'm not sure how true it is, but there's, there's a line from Fargo. I haven't looked into this, but it sounds reasonable enough. But it's from a TV show, so, you know, who, who knows? But in Fargo, there's a question one character poses to another. He asks him a riddle. You know, the human eye can detect more shades of green than any other color. And he asks why that is. And it's supposed to be some philosophical thing. And the guy's daughter figures it out immediately because, you know, uh, you need to be able to tell the grass from the lion. You need to be able to tell that difference or you're not going to survive very easily. And again, it's a TV show. That may just be made up. But it makes a lot of sense either way because that is sort of like how evolution works. Um, our eyes didn't need to be as good as a hawk's. Our eyes needed to be able to tell where the lions were. The hawk's eyes need to be able to tell where the rats they're looking for are. Or, you know, your tiny little dog that maybe wandered too far away from home. Um, but that's kind of grim. So let's keep going. The design is overwhelming. It's everywhere. Where does design originate? Well, what you and I both know is that when you see things that function and they're complex, that design comes from an intelligent designer. No, we don't know that. In fact, we have mountains of evidence for evolution, which doesn't require an intelligent designer and actually works better without one. Big explosions just simply don't bring about order. They don't cause things that are functional and complex. To yes, they do, actually. I mean, you know, this is like something you can like test straight up. Like, so, um, gas and dust in the universe, how do they originate? Well, I mean, in a lot of cases, it's going to be from supernovas. You can have supernova remnants, big ones, uh, remnants from multiple supernovas, let's say. Not just the one. Let's assume that there's like a, a, a stellar nursery that has a lot of bigger stars. Those bigger stars live shorter lives of like a few million years, and then they go boom. So you're left with like a lot of gas and dust, and you have gigantic nebulas that result from that kind of thing and other processes. And what do we see happening in those nebulas today? Well, they're star-forming regions. You can see baby stars being born inside of nebulas. Not just that, you can see protoplanetary disks, which uh, planets will form from, comets will form from. You can see these things being created in real time, uh, slowly, of course, and at different stages, all from the result of exploding stars. Chaos leading to order, explosions leading to order. You can see this happening all the time. Hell, you can see it in your own life if you look hard enough, not with explosions, I would hope. I hope you're not doing anything weird out there. But look at your own life. I'm sure you can think of at least a time or two that chaos, a great deal of it, has somehow led to order. Chaos itself can lead to order. In fact, it's hard to say there could be order without chaos. You really need those two. They kind of work hand in hand, don't they? to come into existence. The design we see in the universe demands a supernatural, intelligent designer. Another assertion. These are just assertions. Proof number three. Life demands a supernatural life giver. You see, in the material world, we have come to understand that there is a law of biology called the law of biogenesis. Law of biogenesis simply says this, that in this material, natural world, life comes from previously existing life of its own kind. Now, when Okay, so I think there is a lot you could nitpick at here specifically. 
When these people refer to any scientific concept, you should be aware they're misrepresenting those concepts by default. They use these things in ways that they aren't intended to be used because um, these people don't understand what they're talking about. These people aren't trained in science. They don't, I mean, this man might be, I don't know. But most of the time, they're not trained in these sciences, so they really don't understand what they're even talking about. When it comes to something like what he's calling the law of biogenesis, I have never heard of this personally. It may exist. I don't know. I don't really care a whole lot. But um, it, it's going to mean something very different if it does. So yes, um, if I am a human, I came from humans. But if, let's, 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 let's extend this to other animals, because humans, I don't, I don't know, what's the point of using humans? Let's extend this to, like, dogs. So let's say that chihuahuas escape. Let's say that chihuahuas escape. There are no more domestic chihuahuas. They all just go outside and hang out and we let them do that. Uh, chihuahuas are already very different than other bigger dogs. And if left on their own, chihuahuas do not seem that fit to, let's say, hunt. They may, I mean, they may be able to like eat bugs and stuff to survive or maybe rats. But one would expect that for chihuahuas to survive, they would probably have to do some evolving. They might have to evolve to be a little bit bigger, a little bit faster. They might have to evolve to eat plants. Um, it's a possibility. They might have to evolve in any number of ways. You give chihuahuas 100,000 years without human intervention, and you're going to end up with something very different than the dogs of today, most likely. Now, will they still be some form of canine? Well, probably. I mean, I think that's pretty obvious. But you give it, let's say, 10 million years. 10 million years of changing environments, no human involvement, is a chihuahua really going to be that similar to a wolf at this point? Well, no, it's not going to be. These small changes accumulate and add up. These things do change. What he is implying here is that if there is a law of biogenesis, it kind of excludes evolution because things come from their kinds, and creationists use kinds to mean like, you know, dogs are dogs, cats are cats. Um... But evolution, we know, is real. We, that's a fact. This is beyond dispute. You cannot tell me that evolution is not real because we have just mountains of evidence for it. We have a fossil record that proves uh, our linkages to ape-like ancestors and proves our linkages to other species. We have an extensive DNA record that proves our linkage to every other form of life on Earth that would go back to a single individual life form at the very beginning of life on Earth. We have these things. If there is a law of biogenesis, which, you know, whatever, I'll assume there is. I've never heard of it, but I haven't heard of a lot of things. I'm, I'm a modest person, so I don't really care. Um, that does not mean that life has always existed. Essentially, what that means is, once life does exist, it has to keep reproducing or it dies out. It's going to be such that life did not always exist. At some point, it started existing, and once it started existing then it had to continue existing, and it continues existing by breeding, by spreading its genes, or, I mean, if it produces asexually in that way, reproducing asexually, very different. So, whatever this is that he's trying to describe here, um, it's not about to go the way he thinks it is, so let's see what he's about to say. When we look at how people used to think about life, they said, no, life can arise spontaneously from non-living chemicals. And yet every single biological experiment has shown us that that simply is biologically impossible. Life Wrong. Uh, no, that is not biologically impossible. And the only thing is, we have to figure out how it first happened. That is a hard process because, to reiterate for a point from before, uh, the universe had billions of years to figure this out. I mean, let's assume life on Earth popped up exactly 3 billion years ago. That's about almost 11 billion years after the universe uh, came into being, right? So the universe had something like 10 billion years to work on it before life emerged. Um, amino acids are everywhere. Water, carbon, they're everywhere. The building blocks of life are everywhere in the universe. We probably are not the only life, but life, for it to exist, it had to come from somewhere. There is no indication that the first life form was created by the hand of God. Much like we don't see any hand of God come down and implant a fetus into the womb, we do not see any evidence that God came down and planted the first life on earth. 
We just don't see it because it's not there. Uh, life came into existence about 3 billion years ago through natural processes, and we are trying to figure that out. But the universe has a 13 billion year head start on us with this one. Um, the universe has been around a very long time. Humans have not. They have, I mean, the universe, and then I said they there, but the universe isn't that they, them. I just want you to, the universe is not non-binary. It's, it's not even gendered. But the universe has a very, very long head start on us. We haven't figured it out yet, but that doesn't mean we can't figure it out. Life doesn't arise from non-living chemicals. From where did life arise? Well, don't you know God just reached down and put that there life in there and suddenly there was life. That's where life came from. What's more scientific than that? But even Socrates would tell you that. Where did life originate if it doesn't arise from non-living chemicals? You see, the idea that there's no God suggests to us that there had to be some singularity without a cause. Why is the singularity black? I mean, like, I would like to think the singularities are like very bright white. If they're not, that's really... I might have to start believing in God just because of that. Cause ...that exploded, and that explosion brought about design, which we've never, ever seen happen, and then ultimately... We have seen that happen. Again, we, we have seen that happen uh, more than once, in fact. And you could also say in different ways. Uh, think about this, for example. Uh, Chernobyl. You know, there was that whole nuclear reactor disaster in uh, the Soviet Union in the 80s. And that was no fun for a lot of people. And probably not too fun for the animals either, but scientists have discovered that animals just evolved to deal with that radiation. That is an example of order from chaos, a direct one. The chaos of the nuclear reactor meltdown and releasing large amounts of radiation resulted in order that came from animals evolving ways to deal with it. That's, uh, that's order from chaos right there. Ultimately, Somewhere the non-living chemicals gave rise to life, but that's biologically impossible. Life that's an assertion. You're wrong. Life demands a supernatural creator. Wrong. Proof number four. Moral law demands a moral law giver. Oh boy, here we go with the uh, moral law. Well, here's my perspective. Uh, there is no moral law. The universe doesn't care. Let me use an example from Islamic apologetics because, man, are they wild. Um, let's say you throw a baby off a roof. What would I think about that? Well, I would think that's wrong. Uh, does the universe think that's wrong? Well, no. So why do I think it's wrong? Well, because I have empathy. I was a baby once. I wouldn't want somebody to have thrown me off a roof. Um, I've also, you know, had relatives that have been babies. When my nephew was born, I held him in my arms, I cradled him. If somebody had grabbed him from my arms and thrown him off a roof, I would not have liked that a whole lot. Uh, I wouldn't have liked that one bit. So empathy tells me it's wrong to throw babies off rooftops. But does the universe care? Well, no. So I don't think there is any objective moral law. I think all of this is, in the end, uh, subjective. So, no, empathy is what gives me what I would call my own moral law, but I don't think there is such a thing, really. I mean, I have my moral codes, I have my ethics, but I don't have any moral laws handed down to me from above. And honestly, um, if there is a moral lawgiver, the Christians have a really big problem. We may get to that in a second, though. If some things are objectively morally right, and other things are objectively morally wrong, then there must be a God. You see? Um, I don't think so. So I don't think anything is really uh, objectively morally right or wrong. Again, the universe doesn't care. Uh, morality is a human construct. We can s decide as a society what is right and wrong. But we can't really say for sure. I mean, the universe, if it did have its own standards, may have standards very different than our own. Um, but it doesn't. So, no. There is no objective anything to do with morality. Morality is an entirely human construct. If we evolve from primordial slime over multiplied millions of years, at what point did objective moral values arise? We don't I love how he's just going from the assumption that there is uh, objective morality. There is not, in my opinion. Don't look at a dog and say that that dog objectively, morally violated some rule when he steals a bone from another dog. 
We don't say, hey, he violated a objective moral value. We just don't say that. But we do say that humans can perpetrate things that are objectively morally wrong, that humans can be involved in things that are morally right. If that Well, religious people say that. I wouldn't say that. It's true. There must be a God. Proof number five, free will exists. Nope, it does not. There have been studies done on this. In fact, as far as I'm aware, every single study ever done to test free will has had the same results. There is none. Um, this is a big problem for creationists and Christians, but it doesn't need to be because if God exists and already knows everything that's ever going to happen, how can free will exist? But I digress. Let's keep going. The atheistic idea that there is no God is founded on the idea of materialism. The idea that this material world is all that there is, all that there was, and all that there ever will be. Let's not forget material girls. Because of that, atheism has to suggest that you as a person don't really have free will. That there is no being inside of your body or brain that is super matter. That really what's going on in your brain is just electrons bouncing around and you're the product of those bounces. And you don't really make decisions on your own. It's just the physical laws and properties going on in your brain. Correct. That is an accurate uh, assessment of the situation. Now, of course, there are some atheists who believe in free will, uh, but they are wrong because, again, we've done studies on this. There have been scientific studies that show very well scientists can predict multiple seconds in advance, sometimes up to 10 seconds in advance, what decision you are going to make before you have any conscious awareness of making that decision. That right there, to me, kind of proves it. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, every study ever done proves that free will isn't really a thing. So yes, we are all the result of our brain chemistry. There has never been any scientific study that has pointed to something greater than your brain matter controlling everything about you. In fact, give someone a traumatic brain injury. Okay, maybe I said that the wrong way. Don't give somebody a traumatic brain injury. That would not be very nice. But if somebody gets a traumatic brain injury, it can do terrible things to them. The person they are can be changed forever in very negative ways. Um, the person they were can disappear entirely and cease to exist. They can become an entirely new person, completely unrelatable to the old one. So the fact that that can happen implies that there is no soul, no spirit, no essence that defines you. What defines who you are is your brain and its matter. If you are watching this video of your own volition, then the fact of the matter is there has to be a God. I am watching this video because I am a masochist. And I did not choose to be a masochist. I did not choose to hate myself so much that I would voluntarily subject myself to this in front of an audience. Who would choose that? So, no, that is not a choice that I or anyone would make. That right there already disproves your notion of free will. That can account for that free will that you as a person have. There has to be a God if there is free will. And proof number six. I don't think there does. I don't think free will exists, but I, I think that you probably could make some kind of a secular case for uh, free will uh, being a real thing. I don't buy it. I think there's no scientific reason to think that's the case, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe there is. Uh, I haven't seen one. I haven't seen a good argument in favor of free will from a secular position, but I'm sure that they exist. Human reasoning. You see, we reason. All also, before he moves on, I also want to say this one thing, though. There are Christians. There are Christian denominations and sects that don't believe in free will. So he's asserting that everybody believes in free will when really there are a lot of people that don't on a regular basis. We understand abstract ideas. If we were products of blind chance, random processes over multiplied millions of years, reasoning and the law... Multiply millions of years, you know, survival of the fitness, yo. ...laws of reasoning simply would have no explanation. And yet... How? How? What makes that the case? Again, he's just asserting something, that human reasoning just can't exist. Well, why not? 
Uh, humans, like a lot of creatures, we recognize patterns. Humans are better at it than most other creatures, and it gets us into a lot of trouble. Essentially, what fuels human reasoning is our pattern recognition abilities and our ability to extrapolate on those and test those. There's no reason to think the natural universe couldn't prove that. What patterns are we picking up on? Well, we're picking up on patterns in the natural universe, aren't we? We reason together on a regular basis. From where does reason arise? The brain. It's got no naturalistic, atheistic explanation. The brain. I just said that. Anthony Flew, the atheist who wrote Theology and Falsification, the most popular atheistic paper for the last hundred years, the last century. In 2006, he co-wrote a book titled, There is a God, How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Became a Believer. He stated that his rule of life had always been to follow the evidence where it leads. And he said he followed that evidence. And it led him to the conclusion that there is a supernatural, intelligent God. Okay, if you haven't heard of Anthony Flew, I don't blame you. Uh, it's claimed that he's the most notorious atheist, but I really don't think. Maybe he was before, like, Dawkins and Hitchens and Harris came along, but he isn't now. Uh, he died a long time ago, actually. So there's a lot of controversy over Anthony Flew and his late-in-life conversion away from atheism. So let me explain that very briefly. He was old, and a lot of people think he had dementia. And when somebody has dementia, I guess they're a lot easier to convince of things. I mean, after a point with dementia, you just, like, don't have any capacity to reason whatsoever. But before you get to that point, um, you're, you're, you can fall prey to suggestion more easily. So a lot of people think that he was in dealing with some late-in-life dementia or something along those lines, and a Christian got to him and made him believe in things that, you know, he would have never believed in had he been in his right mind. Um, now, I'm not going to say for sure that that's the case. I'm not going to say that's true. He could have changed his mind. Um, it could have happened that way. I'm not going to, like, say for sure. I just say, I'm just saying there was a controversy about it. But I think what's going to go unmentioned here is this. Anthony Flew did not become a Christian. No, no, no. He may have been convinced by a Christian, but he did not become one. Anthony Flew became a deist. He recognized, whether rightly or wrongly, that there was enough evidence for a God to make him believe in one. However, that was not the Christian God. It was not even a personal God. It was a God that created the universe and then just kind of forgot about it. Left. Was done with it. And honestly, if there was, who can blame him? Um, so he's pointing to this as an example of an atheist who became religious, but he's going to like miss something here, which is that Anthony Flew did not become religious. He didn't become a Christian. He did not believe in a personal God. He believed in a creator God that just was like, okay, I'm done here and left. Uh, that's very important because that's a very different kind of God than is being argued for in this video, which is by a Christian apologist. So let's let the evidence lead us to that same conclusion. Yes, let's let the uh, evidence lead us to the conclusion that I want you to be led to. Now, I think people should make their own conclusions based on the evidence, and I don't think there was much evidence in this video. This was a lot of assertions, and assertions that are very easy to debunk, that have been debunked over and over. Now, I appreciate that this ends with an Anthony Flew quote, uh, because it allows me to point out something that's very obvious to me, but not so obvious to Christians. These arguments in favor of God, even if they are completely correct, do not point to your God. There is a big gap between proving the existence of a God and that being your God. But they always seem to forget this point. I understand why. If they can prove that there is a God, then it's a much smaller leap to go, it's their God. But I think Anthony Flew points out by his very existence, by his very nature, that that's not necessarily the case. Any honest person who believes in God will have to admit that while there could be, feasibly, reasons to believe in a God, there's really not to believe in any of these specific gods. If there were, there wouldn't be any atheists. But that's all of this video. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you have a great day, night, evening, whatever it is. I hope you have a great one, and uh, thanks for watching.